Sabbath school lesson this morning, I really appreciated uh, what I heard as I came in this morning. Um, the emphasis again, as we have emphasized all week long in our encounters with Jesus, Jesus. And um, I want to continue to lift him up this morning, if that is okay with you. Is that okay with all of you? We want to keep the main thing the main thing. We want to keep our focus and our emphasis on Jesus. Now, the title is The Resurrection and the Life and Death. Another title that I have for this, this message is Jesus and the Dead Man. Jesus and the Dead Man. Before I get into the message this morning, I'd like to have a word of prayer. I need the Holy Spirit. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath day. Thank you for my Shelton family. Now, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would take over. Pray that you would fill not just this building, but you would fill every living temple in this place. Make us the habitation for your presence. Manifest your power to change and to transform lives. Help us to encounter Jesus again today. And that by that encounter, we will become changed from glory to glory. Speak your word to us now, Lord, because if I speak, nothing's going to happen. If I speak, Lord, there will be no life. But the words you speak, they are spirit and they are life. And your words will not return to you void, according to Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11. Speak, Lord, for your people are listening. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm going to get my best to get through this um, in a shorter amount of time because I believe that the highlight today is the baptism. Um, I think that that's, that's what the highlight is today. And then um, I hope to stay by a little while, possibly for the fellowship meal pastor because I will be heading out. I have a speaking engagement um, at 2 o'clock, 2, 3 o'clock this afternoon with New Life Puyallup, a church that we planted last year that will become an official church um, at the end of this month in the conference. And we're going to have a big celebration um, with that. Um, as I've mentioned, all throughout the week, I've shared and sprinkled in my, t my personal testimony with the messages. And with each encounter, we have discovered that man is incapable of changing and of saving himself. Family, I want to reiterate that. I want to reemphasize that, that there's nothing that we can do to earn salvation. There's nothing that we can do to earn heaven. It is a gift from God. Would you say amen? amen. From, the, from the proud Pharisee Nicodemus to the social and moral outcast woman at the well to the demoniac to the rich young ruler. And then last night we looked at the Syrophoenician woman who was desperate that Jesus would deliver her daughter from the devil. It, it, it reminds us again of the human condition that we are incapable, unable, powerless to save ourselves. But I'm so thankful though that God is still in the business of saving souls. Um, in fact, in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, the Bible says that God is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us for it, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Sorry, I just had to have that dramatic, you know just to show you how long-suffering God is. Aren't you thankful that God is long-suffering and patient? Amen. I can tell you that I am thankful. When I look back on my life and I reflect what God delivered me from, he delivered me from the streets, used to run in a gang, used to deal drugs, used to be a drug addict myself, used to be alcoholic, in and out of the system, in and out of jail, in and out of prison, from Washington down to Oregon, down into California, into Hawaii, recruiting young people to be my runners and to distribute drugs, destroying people's lives. In fact, one of my nicknames on the street was crime minister because I quoted scripture even as a gangster. <laughs> even put scripture in the rap lyrics that I used to rap. 
But now God has rescued me from that lifestyle. God has rescued me from the streets. God has rescued me from my addiction. God has rescued me from the power of the enemy, and he has put the word of God in my heart. Psalm chapter 119, verse 11, the Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. There is power in the word of God. Do you believe that, church? I've been traveling around, and during the pandemic, the Lord, the Holy Spirit has not slowed down. There's, not a, there's no pandemic, there's nothing in the world that can impede and stop the work of the Holy Spirit, Amen. can stop the work of the gospel. You see, my favorite sign in all of Matthew chapter 24 is found in verse 14 where Jesus said, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. But can I tell you, family, that it's not just a proclamation of the gospel that is needed, there also must be a demonstration of the gospel. In other words, there must be a demonstration of the power of God in your life. People ought to be able to know that you've been with Jesus, according to Acts chapter 4, verse 13, where the Pharisees and the leaders of the nations were so amazed at the disciples because they were unlearned men who did not have degrees, and yet they knew that these men had been with Jesus. Can people tell from this community that you have been with Jesus? Are you oozing Christ? <laughs> Oh, man, I don't know about you, but I'm excited today. The fact that we're going to have a baptism and witness the Holy Spirit at work. Do you know that all of us have a front row seat to watch the Holy Spirit work? Front row seats. The only thing we're missing is popcorn. (laughs) Front row seats to watch the Holy Spirit do his thing. When I go to New Life Puyallup, there will be a bunch of young people waiting over there as well. And I want to tell you that I'm excited that um, on the last Sabbath of this month, I will be baptizing several young people at New Life. Would you say amen? amen. Including a gentleman. Check this out. You, you, you got to hear this story. Including a gentleman that I recruited over 25 years ago in Hawaii to be a part of the gang. He was a teenager. He was a teenager when I recruited him, sent him out to do mischief and to deal drugs, and he was, in, he was involved in all types of violent acts as well. Well, unbeknownst to me, I didn't know that he had moved to Washington with his family some years later, and just a few months ago, God reconnected us. And praise be to God, when he reconnected us and we made an appeal, he and his daughter both came forward for the appeal, and he, I'm going to have the privilege of baptizing a young man that I led down the wrong path, and now he's coming back to Jesus. Who, who can do that but God? I've had the privilege since the pandemic took place, and I think the last time I was here. So since 2020 to the present time, I praise God and I give him all the glory. I have been, I've had the privilege and the blessing of being involved with over 400 baptisms. That's all the Lord's doing. The majority of those are young people, youth and children. I'm going all out. You see, I can't help, this is what I believe. I believe that God doesn't waste any of our experiences. He's he's not wasting any of my experience that I had on the street. The same same mentality that I had on the street, the same uh, when it comes to being real, going all out, and, 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 you know, just giving it all for your homies and for your gang. The same thing that I used to do there, God now has turned it around, and he is using it for his glory. All out. All in. When I see the mass shootings in this country... When I see the mass shootings in this country, children being killed by children, you don't think that the devil is going all out to destroy our young people? You don't think that the devil is, has it has on his agenda to take out our children? Parents, I want to remind you that we need, to, we need to bring, just as that desperate mother last night was seeking Jesus and knew that only Christ could help her in her situation with her daughter. She couldn't do it. 
She didn't have the power. Nicodemus didn't have the power to save himself. The, 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 the woman at the well doesn't have the power to save herself. The demonia can't save himself. The rich young ruler can't save himself. The woman who was desperate for her daughter can't save herself. And you're going to discover that even Lazarus can't save himself or resurrect himself. We all need Jesus. Yeah. doesn't matter if you've been in Adventist for 30, 40 years. That alone is not going to save you. All your Sabbath keeping... All your checkbox religion is not going to save you. It's not good enough. It doesn't measure up. The only righteousness that counts, the only righteousness that matters, is the righteousness of Jesus. Which, by the way, he's willing to give us as a gift every single day. Good to see you, Heron. God raised up this church for such a time as this in this community to be a light in this dark space. And family, I want to share with you that God is not afraid of the dark and he is not intimidated by evil. God will enter into any dark space. I'm asking you for special prayer because, oh, by the way, um, after I'm done with New Life this afternoon, I will then head into Seattle for a 5 o'clock meeting tonight, worship meeting tonight, with about 40 Muslims who are observing the Sabbath. House churches. I've been working with the Muslim community for over a year now. And an imam and his wife and their family, along with 40 plus people, have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I mean, some of you might be wondering, man, why does this guy come in like a house of fire? Why is he, why is he so fired up and, and, and excited? Because I'm witnessing on a daily basis what God can do. So I'm going to go there with my Muslim brothers and sisters. Oh yeah, I'm gonna roll out that mat along with them, get down, say prayers with them, but we're praying to Jesus. Amen. Soon and very soon, that group will become a church in the Adventist church. Next Sabbath, I'll be in Atlanta, Georgia. I'll be in Atlanta, Georgia as the main speaker for an ordination service of a young man that I discipled when he was 15. He became a Bible worker that I trained and discipled. And now he's a pastor there in Rome, Georgia for two churches. And he said, Pastor Nehemiah, you poured into me. You mentored me. I didn't even know how to speak English. I could barely speak English when I came to you at the age of 15. And now the Lord has blessed him, and I'm going to be a part of his ordination service. Would you say amen to that? Amen. The following Sabbath, weekend, I should say the week, the following week, I will be in, I will be in eastern Washington where I will be speaking at the camp meeting all week long to the youth. And I'm going to do what is called a youth encounters with Jesus. Man, the Holy Spirit has given me some stuff to share with the youth. The one thing, and, I'm, and I, I, wish, um, I wish my wife and my, my kids could be with me this morning, um, but my 16-year-old daughter is ministering in another church today. She's, uh, she's, she's singing at another church. She's doing special music. Um, on August the 6th, she will be preaching in Bellingham. And uh, the Lord has given her some serious boldness. And uh, I, one of the things I appreciate about my daughter is that she has kept me up to speed with all the teenage lingo today. Because I said, I said, honey, I need your help. 
When I go over there to Eastern Washington to speak to those young people, I need to speak their language. And she said, oh, no problem, Dad. I got you. I got you. So, you know, she's been, she's been teaching me in a class all the, the verbiage and the words that youth use today. It's amazing, right, how language changes over time. That the words that we know from back then um, don't carry the same meaning today. Thankfully, God's word doesn't ever change. No one can alter it or change it. So let's, let's go. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just letting the Holy Spirit uh, lead. Is that okay? If I get into the slides, I get into it. If not, then I, I won't do it. One of the things that I'm learning, uh, Sister Deborah, is how to lean in on the Holy Spirit. And just let him lead. Because he knows, he knows everybody in here better than I do. Thank you for that song, When We All Get to Heaven. I can't wait for that day. Would you say amen? amen. Are you looking forward to it? Nathan, I'm looking forward to being there with you, my young brother, for all eternity. Same thing with Levi, Tammy, Linda, and Marty back there. Aren't you guys looking forward to spending eternity together? Man, we're going to have a lot of fun. You know what really blew me away is when I saw that young man with the beanie on there playing piano this morning. Yeah, man, that was awesome. I love seeing our young people. Um, involved in, in the church and in the worship service. You know, and, 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 and typically when I walk into a church at service, and, uh, and please don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying here, um, but, you know, usually when you watch in, you typically see um, a, a, a dear sister or a dear lady, um, somebody like that at the piano. But, man, when I walked in and I saw this young guy playing piano, I said, Lord, look at what you're doing. Amen. Come on. Don't you think that the greatest investment that we can make is investing and pouring into our young people? Allowing them to use their giftedness for God's glory? I mean, it's funny how I used to rap and all this, these curse words used to come out of my mouth. And, and God still uses that gift of, of gab that he's given to me. Just, it's, it's just not in rap anymore. I don't, I don't lay down tracks and, and sell them out of the trunk of my car like I used to. Now I'm just spitting the gospel. Amen. Sorry, speaking the gospel. <laughs> spitting is, you know, uh, yeah. that's, a street, that's a street term. Yeah. The other thing I'm thankful for, Lord, just take the wheel. Here, here's what else I'm thankful for. God can break generational curses and generational cycles, generational cycles. Would you say amen? amen? And aren't you thankful that Jesus entered into our family tree to do it? <laughs> All you got to do is read the genealogy of Christ in Matthew chapter 1 and in Luke chapter 3. Look at his genealogy. Look at who's there. Messed up people. I mean, I can get into the men, I can go down the line and break them all down for you. King David and Solomon and all these messed up men. I mean, messed up. But you think about the women, too, who are in his genealogy. You have, you have Rahab, who is a prostitute. What? A prostitute in the line of Jesus? Hold up, preacher. A prostitute in the line of Jesus. He descended from her. Ruth, a Moabite, not even a Jew, a Gentile. He came from her. Bathsheba, who was raped, by the way, by David. I know a lot of people don't like to hear it like that and put it like that, but she was raped. He came from her. Tamar, the daughter-in-law of Judah who feigned that she was a prostitute and slept with her father-in-law and bore children. He came 
from her. And so what I'm sharing with you, family, is that there is power in the blood. There is power in Christ to break generational cycles. Would you say amen? And curses. You don't have to perpetuate what has happened in the past. You, you must understand that I come from generations of men who were drunks and, and, and violent. I mean, my father was a violent man, and he was a pastor in the Adventist church. Helped establish the work in Samoa, in Hawaii, in California, here in Washington. But that did not stop all 10 of his boys from venturing out into the streets and getting in trouble. But can I tell you that when my mother began to pray for us, and when my mother bathed us in prayer, that the Holy Spirit began to go to work, and he broke those generational cycles and generational curses in our lives, I don't have to succumb to being a drunkard. I don't have to succumb and give in to give, having a bad temper. All I can do is just submit and surrender and allow Jesus to do his work in my life. And he can do the same for you. Amen. Whatever it is in your, and by the way, the servant of the Lord writes this, and I'm paraphrasing. She said that the Holy Spirit has been sent to help us to overcome every, all cultivated and hereditary tendencies to evil. Would you say amen? amen. The Holy Spirit has been sent. To help us. So whatever it is that we practice, whatever it is that comes through our bloodline, the power of the blood of Jesus is much greater. Amen. Man, I'm hoping that, us, that we as Adventists, I'm speaking to my family. One of the things that you're going to discover about me is I'm very raw, I'm very real, I'm very authentic, I'm very transparent. And I have, no, I have no problems being vulnerable. I love it when young people come up to me and say, man, we thought that our pastors were perfect. Uh, wrong. Your pastors are not perfect. We need Jesus just as much as anyone else, if not more. Amen. Would you say amen? amen? So that's why you guys got to keep praying for your pastor back there and his wife and their family. Let me just touch on this real quickly about the dead man. In the Gospel of John chapter, in the whole Gospel of John rather, you have the seven, the seven signs of Jesus, right? The seven signs or miracles of Jesus. The crowning act or the crowning sign or miracle of Jesus is when he raises Lazarus from the dead in John chapter 11. That's the crowning act, the crowning miracle, if you will, proof of his divinity. You also have the seven I am statements of Jesus in the Gospel of John, declaring that he is all that he claims to be, that he is indeed divine, that he is indeed God the Son. Would you say amen? amen. And he makes declarations that, I mean, just are mind-boggling, including the declaration that I am the resurrection and the life. You can't make a declaration like that unless you're God. Because who else can give life but God? That's why Jesus said in John chapter 10 verse 10 that the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I am come that you might have what? Life. And life more abundantly. John chapter 17 verse 3, what does Jesus say there? Jesus says, and this is life eternal. That they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Would you say Amen. Let me get to this, and then I'm going to. Matthew chapter 11, verses 4 through 6. Jesus is with his disciples, and the Bible says that when Jesus heard that um, there was a messenger that came from Lazarus' sisters, Martha and Mary, to inform Jesus that Lazarus, or the one that he loves, is sick. Christ was close to this family. Ellen says in the book Desire of Ages that Christ felt like at home whenever he was with this family. Like, you must understand all the things that Christ had to endure while here on earth. And it was here at 
the home of Lazarus and Mary and Martha that Jesus felt like, man, he felt like he, he could find some respite. He could, he could have a little bit of a break. He was loved by these siblings. A message is sent that the one that you love is sick. Please come, hurry. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death. This sickness is not unto death, but I want you guys to notice something here. But for, what's the next, what's the next phrase? But for the what? For the glory of who? Of God. That the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. So it almost seemed as if Jesus had ignored the message, but... He said that this sickness was not unto death, but it's for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Why is that important? Because it would be this, it would be the act of raising Lazarus that would put the proverbial nail in the coffin in sending Jesus to the cross. Interesting that he would, by the resurrection of this man, it would lead to his death. Because this would be the miracle that would cause the Pharisees and and the council to then plot the death of Jesus Christ. They said, you know what? Man, this guy, this guy is too much. Now we've got to do something about him. We've got to act on him. We've got to act on this. But Jesus, I love it. He says that all of this is for the glory of God, the glory of God. It's, a, it's going to be a demonstration and a revelation of God's, of God's character because glory represents God's character. It's his character. Now, how is he going to do that? Let me Continue on. Hope I'm. Yep, thank you. Then verses 7 through 10, it says here, then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and you are going there again. And well, Jesus answered and said, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Simply, Jesus is putting it this, that as long, as long as God has a purpose for our lives while we're here on earth and while it is yet day, it is time to go to work. Would you say amen? It's time to be about the Father's business. It's time to let God use you. That's the one thing I also want to drop on, on my family here today is that Every single person in this room, every person in this church, God, the Holy Spirit has given gifts and talents for which you can, can utilize those gifts and talents to point others to Jesus. It doesn't matter what space you are in. It doesn't matter what place you are in. Your circle of influence, your circle of friends, your family members, the community in which you live, where you work, where you play, where you work out. I want to tell you, family, that God has given each and every one of us gifts in order to share Jesus with others. So if you're a mechanic, be the best mechanic. If you're working in the medical field, be the best where you are. If you are working in construction or you're a contractor, be the best at that. Be faithful and let the light of God's glorious um, countenance shine upon you. Let the light of Jesus shine in you and through you um, to all those who are around you. Every single one of us in this room and in this church can have an impact in the community and in the lives of other people. Would you say amen? amen. Everyone. Every person. Jesus said as long as there are 12 hours in the day. The Bible also tells us that it is now time to work while it is yet day because the night comes when no man can work. We are fast approaching that time. There's not a single minute to lose. The one thing I'm thankful for too in the book of Joel chapter 2, it reminds us that, that God can restore the years that the locusts have eaten. Let me continue on. Now Jesus and the disciples head out. And as they're approaching Bethany, where where the siblings live, Martha comes out to Jesus. And you guys know the conversation. I don't want to get into all the conversation. I'm just going to mention and highlight certain things. And she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus said to her, I am 
<laughs> I am the what, everybody? The resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall what? Live. Jesus declares that I am the resurrection and the life. All throughout the week I've been talking about, I've been mentioning C.S. Lewis and how C.S. Lewis once upon a time was a prominent atheist turned Christian apologist and great defender of the faith. In fact, the way that he came to faith was he was confronted with the reality of Jesus and had this encounter thanks to his friend J.R.R. Tolkien, who was a devout Catholic, and God used J.R.R. Tolkien to influence and to point C.S. Lewis to Jesus. And when he was confronted with this reality, praise be to God, that C.S. Lewis, C.S. Lewis said, man, you know what? Jesus is not just a moral teacher or a good man. Jesus is indeed the Son of God and all that he claims to be. And praise be to God that C.S. Lewis gave his heart to Jesus. The resurrection and the life. I don't think that there's any more, there's any other better way to put it in terms of our human condition than what we see with Lazarus. All week long, I've been talking about other people, but now we come to a point where Jesus encounters a dead man. Anybody here witness a dead person resurrect himself? Save themselves? That's as helpless and as hopeless as a situation for any human being to be in. He's dead. Now, I'm going to hit on something here that, here we go. I want you to notice what the grace chapter in Ephesians chapter 2 tells us. And you, who? Go ahead, say it. I was hoping you would say you because then you, so you're talking to me. I, yeah, this guy. And, and who? <laughs> Thank you. And Nehemiah, he made alive. So if, if he made alive, what does that mean? I was dead. Who were dead in what? Trespasses. In trespasses. And what else? Sin. Sins. And according to the book of Romans, chapter 3, verse 23, how many have sinned? All. all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God, which means that all of us are what? Sin. Dead. We're all dead in our trespasses and sins. That's, that's not my words. Those are the words of the apostle Paul. He is saying that you, he made alive, who were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. I want you to notice the things that keep us dead. Who once walked according to the course of this world, that's number one. According to the prince of the power of the air, that's number two. And then the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we, we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our what? In the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. So, what the Apostle Paul is saying is, listen, this is what keeps us dead. This is what keeps us in this state. He says that it's the world, it's the enemy, the devil, and it's the battle, the greatest battle ever fought. It's the battle against the flesh. Which, by the way, beloved, I want to share with you. None of us in this room, especially this preacher has the power to overcome on our own. There's not one person in here who can conquer the world, who can conquer the devil, and who can conquer the lust of the flesh. But I got good news for you. Jesus has conquered the world, he's conquered the devil, and he's conquered the flesh. And his victory can be yours by faith. Oh, I love that. Somebody said, thank you, Lord. Thank you, sir. Do you know that this is what, this is what true freedom is? Do you know there are so many Christians, even in the Adventist church, who are still shackled? They have yet to experience the freedom that Christ is offering? The freedom from, I'm talking about, you know, freedom where now the allurements of the world, the attractions of the world, 
begin to lose its grip on you. I used to love lighting up the pipe. I used to love sucking on that bottle. Addicted to porn for so many years. Hitting that joint. That crack pipe. And then, when I had an encounter with Jesus, when I had an encounter with Christ, he set me free from that. Even taking the desire and the taste out of my mouth, setting me completely, totally free. Now, it doesn't mean that I don't struggle with other stuff. It doesn't mean that I'm a perfect saint on the freeway. <laughs> Still have an issue with people cutting me off or tailgating. And sometimes that gangster rises up. But then the Holy Spirit says, hey, calm down. Just give it to me. Let me handle this one. Sit this one out. Because if you don't sit this one out and you want to try to take control, you're going to lose. But give it to me, I got it. Some people in here might struggle with gossip, envy, jealousy, bad temper, secret sin, spiritual pride. People that things can't see. We come to church and externally and outwardly, we look like we got it all together, but at home we're a wreck and we're a mess. Broken relationships everywhere. Marriages on the rocks. Mar uh, relationships between parents and children. Relationships between you and your coworkers. Relationships between you and other family members. Relationships with other church family members. This describes the human condition, which only Jesus can save us from. Here's what I love. I'm going to, and you guys know the rest of the story, so I'm, I got to bring this, because I want the pastor and the, and the baptism candidates, you know, to get ready here. I'm going to make an appeal, too. I'm going to make one last appeal before I leave here today, because there might be somebody else that might respond to Jesus. Now, check this out. What's the next two words? <laughs> Come on, church, say it louder. But who? God. God. Would somebody say amen? amen? So notice it says that you were dead in your trespasses and sins. No match for the world. No match for the devil. No match for self. Hopeless, helpless, without strength, ungodly, sinners, enemies of God. Romans chapter 5, verses 6, 8, and 10. This was our condition. The first few verses I read, that was our condition. Paul was saying, we were dead. And then all of a sudden, but God... Woo! But God steps in. And like C.S. Lewis said, that talking about the impossibility of a character in Shakespeare's, uh, Shakespeare's book knowing who the author is, unless the author writes himself into the story and introduces him to the character, himself to the character. He said that much like that, God, in John chapter 1, the Logos, the Logos in John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, it says in verse 14 of that same chapter, and the word became what? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And when you read, when you read the original language of that text, it says that the Logos, God, became flesh, and he moved into our neighborhood. Somebody say amen. 
He moved into our neighborhood. He moved into the neighborhood and the projects where I was running amok, where I was dealing drugs, where I was, where I was smoked out and strung out and drunk and high out of my mind. Jesus came into my neighborhood and Jesus rescued me from the streets. I'm so thankful that Jesus, in order for us to know God the Father, in order for us to have this relationship with God which was broken and severed, Jesus came into the world, took on human flesh and revealed the glory of God and that God is love and that we can have a saving relationship with him. In other words, God wrote himself into the human story. He stepped into our mess. When I was working for the city of Seattle, and I'm going to start to wind this down, but notice it says, but God, who is rich in what? Rich in mercy. Because of his great what? Love Love with which he loved us. Even, even when we were what? Dead in trespasses. Made us alive together with Christ. And then notice this. By works are you saved. Is that what it say? No, it says by grace you have been saved. And raised up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Would you say amen? Now I'm going to share with you real quickly as, a, as closing and part of my appeal. I'm going to ask those who are getting baptized to go with pastor in the back and go ahead and get changed. Praise God for those who are. Let me, let me close with this. Holly, I'm so excited for you. And all those who are getting baptized. Let me, let me close with this, and then I'm going to make a final push, final appeal. When I was working for the city of Seattle, I was working with C- Seattle City Light. Um, long story short. I used to pastor out in Hawaii, and I did evangelism, basically lived my life on a plane for like five years, traveling, traveling about the country and also internationally, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I lost, I lost, I lost my, 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 my focus and my connection with the source. I didn't pray like I should. And because God gave me this photographic memory where he had blessed me with this memory where I can memorize scripture in quotes. It, it's, it, I mean, and, and, and what's, what's a miracle about that is my mind should be fried from all the drugs that I used. Yes, it should. Seriously. It should. Yeah, I mean, when I think about all the stuff that I did to my, to my body, I mean, from, from when I was a teenager, growing up, all the years that, that I spent smoking all those drugs, drinking all that alcohol, I mean, destroying my brain cells. Yeah. It's a miracle of God that he has given me the, 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 the ability to memorize scripture. Yes, amen. Now, unfortunately, I can't memorize my wife's shopping list. <laughs> and she said, maybe you should put scripture next to each one of the line items that I give you when you go to the store. God says, buy milk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Isn't that funny, Deborah? Like, my wife sends me to, the, to, to Costco to do a Costco run, and, and uh, next thing you know, I got a FaceTimer several times in the store. Like, what, what, what else, honey? Did you ask me to? She's like, honey. Okay. <sighs> but I lost my way. It's a cautionary tale. That even while you're, even while you're, you're, you're with God, the key to the Christian life, according to John chapter 15, Jesus mentions 10 times the word abide. He says, abide in me and I in you. Stay connected. Main, he said that relationship needs to be maintained and remain fresh. Are you hearing me, couples in here who are married? That marriage is to remain fresh. Would you say Amen. That relationship is to remain fresh. He says, abide in me and I in you, and you will bear much fruit. 
John chapter 15, verse 5 says that apart from me, you can do nothing. Philippians 4, verse 13 says, though, in, that through me, you can do how many things? All things. So what happened was I left Hawaii in 2003, uh, 2004. I turned my back on God. I turned my back on ministry. I turned my back on the church. Turned my back on the family. Left it all. Went back into the streets. Went back to dealing drugs. Got caught up in that lifestyle again. My wife was so, was so afraid. She said, honey, you've got, to, you've got to stop. Something has to give here. I just, she just gave birth to, um, to our, our baby girl who is now 16, who is now a teenager, and she's going to become a junior in the academy over there at Auburn. And, and she, she wants to become a pediatrician. Now, some people are trying to vector her into, into uh, ministry, you know, like because she's a speaker and stuff like that. But I'm trying to tell her, honey, you know, uh, doctors make just a little bit more than pastors do. Yeah, just a little. And I'm hoping that you would get me that Tesla one day. <laughs> but now, all, all kidding aside, whatever God calls her to be, she'll be. And so what I want to share with you, though, is that my wife was, my wife, we had a, we had a, we had a baby daughter, and... And I had, to, I had to make up my mind. Either I was going to keep on going this way and dealing drugs and doing all this stupid stuff and end up either arrested, back in prison, or yeah. worse, dead. So I gave it up. Amen. I put it on the shelf. Amen. But I, could, I had a hard time finding a job. We got evicted from our apartment in Federal Way. Mm-hmm. We were living out of a van, homeless, mm-hmm. for several months. I, I, I had so much pride because all my family members lived around me in close proximity. All my older brothers, my siblings, all of them, had, all of them were living around me. It wasn't until my, my youngest brother came and found me and said, Mom has been crying about you. She's been having dreams about you. You need to come back home. And you're talking about a younger brother who also is in the streets, also dealing drugs, also spent time in prison. God sent him to find me. Long story short, I come back home, tail between my legs, and, you know, still prideful. But my brother, my older brother, took us, took us in. He said, okay, I'm going to let you guys stay here. We get on our feet. I finally land a job at Seattle City Light in 2008. And for 11 years, I worked there at Seattle City Light in the electrical department. There, when I came in, there was a young, there was, I introduced myself. I said to the crew, I said, I'm Nehemiah. I went around and introduced myself to everyone. 19-year-old Dion Johnson shakes my hand and says, my name is Dion, and around here, brother, it's all about Jesus. I was like, you must understand, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to run from God. I'm trying to do a Jonah. I'm trying to get to work so I can suppress God and forget him. And all of a sudden, what happens is Psalm 139 comes up to my mind where it says that no matter where you go, you cannot escape my spirit. Whether you're in heaven or in hell or wherever you are, the Spirit of God will pursue you. The Spirit of God will chase you. The Spirit of God will come after you. And and the young man then, and what's worse is that they put put me in the truck with that young guy for the next several months to go to and from the job site. And every time I jump in the truck, he says, hey, man, do you you mind? I'm going to say a prayer. And then on top of that, he turns on on his Christian, uh, the radio, and he wants to listen to Christian music. All the while, I mean, I'm thinking to myself, man, okay, okay, all right, all right. We get to the job site. This guy dropping object lessons while we're in the excavation or in the trenches. He points to me one time. He taps me on the shoulder and says, Nehemiah, you see that ladder over there? I said, yeah, what about it? He said, that's Jesus. There's only one way in and one way out. Amen. And it's Christ. Amen. One of the menial jobs that we, one of the menial jobs that we had to do was repair sewer lines, broken sewer lines. There we were in the middle of downtown Seattle, a broken sewer line. And this time, this time it was my, it was his turn and my turn to go out down into that hole to repair it. We put on our Tyvek suits, our mask. We descend down into the hole, and as we get down in the hole, and we got these hip waders on, we step into all that mess. And the stench is unbearable. I mean, that stuff is still flowing out. And then all of a sudden, this guy in the middle, in the middle of a, 
of, of, of a sewage uh, man, just right there. He says, Lord, thank you for stepping into my mess and saving a sinner like me. And the people up top were like, what in the world is going on down there? I looked at that brother and said, I couldn't believe what I said. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. He said, thank you, Jesus, that you stepped into my mess to save me. Do you know that it was at that moment that I had an encounter with Jesus in that sewage? Amen. And Jesus drew me back. Amen. Answering my mother's prayers who would die a short time later. Praise God. That she prayed for her baby boy that he would come back home. Amen. She passed away before I was rebaptized. Before I came back to Christ, but she saw it by faith. Amen. Since the pandemic, and I only mention this because some of you weren't here. Since the pandemic, my mom passed away in 2010. Since the pandemic, I've had the privilege of baptizing over 50 of my own family members. 50, over 50. My younger brother who came and found me, baptized him. My nieces and nephews who were caught up in this lifestyle as well, baptized them. By the way, they're all part of a new church plant in Seattle. And we're worshiping at the Boys and Girls Club. Would you say amen? I can only give all the praise and glory to God. Is there anybody here? Is there anybody here that would like to respond to Jesus and also be baptized? Rebaptized. Praise God. We have a young lady. Mom, Amen. you want to get baptized too? Rebaptized? <laughs> Come on, church. Let's, let's, let's pray because. The Holy Spirit, Pastor, we have a couple of people that are making decisions. So we have, we, have, we have people that are making decisions. Let me be clear about something too. That when people are making decisions, you are baptized into Christ. Amen. Would you say amen? amen? You are baptized into Christ. I think some people get it mixed up with baptism into Christ and baptism into church membership. Now, if you choose to become a part and a member of the body of Christ, we want you to, because that's part of it as well. But understand that first, you are baptized into Jesus. Amen. Would you say amen? amen? I want to be very clear. There have been people who have come at me because of the baptisms and and, and by the way, all those baptisms that have taken place, they're all in local churches, and they're all being discipled. Amen. So it's not like we baptize them and drop them. And I want to tell you, as a church, we, we, need, we better not drop babies. Would you say amen? amen? They are precious to Jesus. Because some people come at me and say, well, you're, holding, you're having all these baptisms. I mean... Are you sure that, that, that people are ready, and when, especially when they make decisions right on the spot, are they ready for baptism? I said, yeah. I said, who am I to stand in the way between somebody making a decision and coming to Jesus? Amen. I said, you want that on your head? And then I also challenged them from the word of God. Show me the vetting process for baptism in the New Testament. How do you, how do you how, yeah, that's right. In, in Acts chapter 2 and 3. How do you account for 3,000 people getting baptized in one day? What does it say that they had to go through all 28 fundamental beliefs first? Now, for those of you who have come that route, praise God. So, here's what I'm going to do. The ones who raised their hand, would you please come forward? I'm going to have prayer with you. I'm going to have prayer with you. I'm going to close right now. Mom, would you come forward, please? Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Church family, this is what it's all about. 
I'm going to have you turn face. And, and you know what? Amen. Pastor, let me, ask you, let me ask you a question. And it's up to you. It's up to you. It doesn't have to be today. But if you have extra robes, I want to tell you that there was a, there was a church that we were doing baptisms. And I actually, we actually made an appeal. And the church, the church was, 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 was uh, freaking out because more people came forward and they didn't have enough baptism robes. <laughs> That's a nice problem to have, though, right? Amen. So um, these two right here, and I, I, and I don't want to close. I don't, I, I don't, I don't want to close. I, I want to linger just a little bit longer. Thank you. Come up. Come up, my brother. Amen. Is there anyone else? Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Is there anyone else before, before I close? I'm lingering on purpose. While the Holy Spirit is thick up in this place. Is there anyone who wants to be baptized or rebaptized, commit, recommit their life to Jesus? I did a series out there at Maranatha Church months ago, and a couple in their 80s stood up Amen. for rebaptism. By the way, they were the founders of that church. Amen. And when the pastor said, "Wait a minute, do you know what Nehemiah was actually appealing for? Do you know that he was actually calling for baptism and rebaptism?" And the gentleman said. I heard him loud and clear. I heard the Holy Spirit loud and clear. And he told me that I need to be rebaptized because I've been like Nicodemus too long. Amen. Amen. Anyone else before I close? Young people in the house? Anyone else? Those who are joining us online, if there's anybody who would like to be baptized, please indicate it in the chat. Pastor would be willing to work with you. I'll be willing to work with you as well. Anyone else before I close, before we pray? Going once, going twice, sold. sold. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I've done what you asked me to do. Even on the drive here, Lord, as I was having this conversation with you, Lord, you impressed upon my heart to make one more appeal. I've done what you've asked. I want to give you all the praise and all the credit and all the glory for how you are moving in all of our lives. Thank you for saving us. We can't save ourselves, but you saved us, Lord. I want to pray for this, these special folks that have come forward, Lord, for baptism, rebaptism. Think about this young lady behind me and my sister and my brother behind me as well. There might be somebody else, Lord, in the congregation that, that knows that they should move and they're struggling and they're wrestling. But, Father, I pray that they would just simply give in, submit, surrender, wave the white flag and say, I've had enough of trying to handle things on my own. I want to give it to you, Jesus. If there's anybody else, Lord, I pray that they too will make that stand. And Lord, here's the final appeal I want to make to my church family. Final appeal. If there's somebody or people that God has placed on your heart to pray for and to intercede for, family members, friends, neighbors, co-workers, enemies, that God has placed on your heart and you know that they need Jesus. You know that you want the Holy Spirit to go and to touch their heart just as he's touched yours. I want you to think about it. I don't know about you, but every single time I make this appeal, I can already see people's faces in my mind. I can see my family members who are still not in Christ. I can see my friends who are still not in Christ. I can see my neighbors who are still not in Christ. And I want them to have an encounter with Jesus. If that's you, and you want to pray for them, and you want to stand on their behalf, I'm going to ask you to stand with me as I close this prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we want to lift up all those that are on our personal prayer list. Every family member, every neighbor, every, work, every uh, co-worker, um, folks in the community, those that we interact with on a daily basis. Father, we are praying that your sweet spirit may also move on their hearts and draw them to Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for accepting us the way we are but not leaving us the way we are. We love you, Jesus. Because you first loved us. In Jesus' name we pray. Let everyone say. Amen. 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 Please be seated.
and um, would like to um, just say to those that, that made decisions that if you guys want to get baptized today, you're welcome to, but if you want to hold off for another Sabbath, we can do that as well. Thank you. Amen.
Praise God. I'm going to, as we're waiting for them, just real quickly, I want to I ask us to turn um, in our hymnals, help me out here, church, to the hymn, He Lives. I don't know a young man can play that, so... Two, f- two five one, and uh, we're going to sing this to celebrate what we have just witnessed. Would you say? Would you say, uh, amen. "Amen"? Praise God for what He has done. So let's uh, let's all sing together. He lives. <clears throat> okay. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. Come on, church. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You asked me how I know he lives. Where does he live? He lives within my heart. 
second verse. And all the world around me, I see his loving care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blast. The day of his appearing will come at last. He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives salvation to impart. You asked me how I know he lives. Where does he live? He lives within my heart. Last verse. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian. Lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King. The hope of all who seek him the help of all who find none other is so loving so good and kind he lives he lives christ jesus lives today he walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You asked me how I know he lives. Tell him where he lives. He lives within my heart. Would you say amen? amen? Praise God. So we just want to give God the praise and the glory. I don't know um, what is scheduled for the rest uh, of our time. I know that we're going to wait on pastor, right, and the baptism candidates to come out. But I just want to say thank you um, to Pastor Alexander, to my Shelton Church family for the opportunity, the invitation to share Jesus. And I want to thank those, um, the volunteers, those who have been faithfully greeting night after night, those who have been there in the back leading out with the, uh, you know, the visual and the sound, as well as uh, those who have been making and baking all of those wonderful cookies that I've had all week and taking to my children all week. I want to say thank you so much. Most of all, I'm thankful that... Uh, I have relationships with my family here Amen. That, will, that will be eternal. Amen. You know, I, I, I solicit your prayers. Um, I need your prayers. My family needs your prayers. Amen. You know, we, we, are, we are committed to the cause of Christ. And uh, I am really looking at my, what, what the focus that God has given me is for our young people, our children, our youth, our young adults, because the devil... The devil's going all out to destroy our young people. And so I just ask that you would pray for me. I need your prayers. I need the prayers of those I love, the hymn says. And so um, thank you guys so much for the time. And isn't this, isn't this a, a wonderful way to celebrate? See, here's what's going to happen. Now, now I go over there to New Life Seattle all pumped up. Uh, I'm not New Life Seattle, but New Life Puyallup. All pumped up. I'm going to meet Tammy's mom over there. And your stepdad, you yes. said, and uh, others that will be joining us there at New Life Puyallup. But I am stoked. Um, I'm going to go and give them a report of what God has done here in Shelton. Would you say amen? amen. That's what it's about. Because then they get, you know, get, they get fired up and people are like, man, God, the Holy Spirit is working everywhere. And he is. Mm -hmm. He is. So Shelton family, take heart, take courage. Somebody, one of the ladies last night mentioned how can we reach this dark territory here? Because there are some who feel like Shelton is a very dark place. And all I can say is, it's only through the light of the cross 
in the light of Jesus Christ that we can reach people and by loving them. Would you say amen? Amen. amen. Loving, loving the unlovable. Just remember how God has been so good to you. He's been merciful to you. Show that same goodness and love and mercy to somebody else in the community. Nathan, I'm praying for you. And when your baptism happens, I'm going to ask the pastor to let me know so I can be here for that. Because uh, you're, you're special, man. Every single, every single person that got baptized today and all of you, you're special. But Nathan, I've been praying for you. And I will continue to pray for you. All week long, man, you've been telling me that, you know, you found a family here. Amen. That you feel like you feel at home here. And I just want you to know that this family is going to love you. Right. And nurture you. And receive you. So, pray for you, my brother. And also, um, I'm praying for your, 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 your granddaughter, right? Your granddaughter. I'm praying for her as well. This is so important, and I'm going to invite pastor and those who, when all of them are, are here, all of them are here, then okay. But let me, let me just, go ahead, let me just share to you that a few months ago, a cousin of mine who pastors out in Kansas City, youth director for many years, worked with so many different young people. And through him, God has won many young people and youth to Jesus Christ. His son, one of his boys, my nephew, um, committed suicide at La Sierra. University in the dorms at La Sierra. He was a student there, studying to go into ministry. So the reason why I share that is because there, there needs to be mental, I mean, there needs to be awareness when it comes to mental health. Yes, there does. And interesting enough that that young man's name was Jalen. And I'm going to tell you, family, he gave no indication, no sign that he was struggling with something. They usually don't. And in fact, he, he left a video for his parents, telling his parents that they were wonderful parents, that they did everything for him. But can you imagine what it must make a pastor feel like? That he's ministering to all these other young people and all these other youth, and they're coming to Jesus, and his own son is struggling. That's why I mentioned with my, with my second boy. God, praise be to God, rescued my oldest son, saved his life. I baptized him last year and his wife and my granddaughter in Hawaii. Amen. Baptized them. We had a broken relationship for years. But my second son is still out there, 21. Still out there on the streets. Still out there doing his thing. Yeah. And while I'm over here preaching here in Shelton, and there are young people who are coming to Christ and other people who are coming to Christ, I am pleading to the Lord to save my son. What's his name? Maya. He's a junior. He's named after me. So what I'm telling you is, and God, God gave me the assurance, though. He said, Nehemiah, he said, listen, as long as you trust in me and put your confidence in me, and wherever I send you to preach the gospel and other people are responding, Leave your son to me. I got him. I got him. So let's, let's not neglect our young people and our children. Pastor, you ready? Those who have been baptized also ready to come forward. And uh, right now all of heaven is celebrating, right? Amen. Luke 15 verses 7 and 10 says that all of heaven and the angels and the last parable says that the father joins in the, the, the celebration. <laughs> oh, man. Go ahead, pastor. It's your turn. I've talked enough.